This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming my third McBroom sister. Today it's Durga McBroom. Previously, I've had Marsha and Lorelai. Uh, Durga, she has had such a huge career as a singer and actress. Um, as a singer, you know, she went on tour with Lorelai, with Pink Floyd. She was in a short-lived band called Blue Pearl. They had that hit, Naked in the Rain. Um, she's been in a lot of uh, music. She was in a lot of music videos back in the 80s, you know, for David Lee Roth and Eurythmics and so forth. Um, as an actress, she was in um, Flashdance. And she was in the Rose, uh, the Rosebud Beach Motel, uh, hotel, I mean, and um, Earth Girls Are Easy, Vendetta. She guest starred episode of Hunter. I mean, she's had just a huge career, and we're going to talk about all that stuff today. And it's going to be a great conversation. The McBroom sisters, they are just wonderful, wonderful ladies. And I'm glad that I've gotten to talk with them. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with Durga McBroom. Hi. Welcome to the show. How are you Hi. today? <laughs> I'm doing great, thanks. How are you? I am just superb. This is uh, such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. My pleasure. So, going back in time, what age did you start gravitating toward music? Well, that's a good question. Um, because I started as an actress. Yeah. Really. Um, from a fairly young age, I did my first professional acting job when I was, oh boy, I was about 11. Right. Years old. And, um, that was with, uh, actually it was a student project, um, at CalArts in California. Right. Uh, when video was very new and the, the videotapes were those big giant cartridges that were like the size of a shoebox. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I played, I played Alice in a production of Alice in Wonderland. Wow. <laughs> um, and my sister Lorelai was really the singer. Yeah. So um, I went to UCLA as a theater arts major. Right. And then um, I left because the, the casting at UCLA was quite racist, believe it or not. Uh, and I figured if I was going to put up that kind of racism, I mean, let's put it this way. I was in a production every quarter, right. which is really good. It means the professor liked me, but I played a maid. I played a voice where you never saw me. Mm -hmm. I played Tichuba the Slave in The Crucible. So you see where I'm going with this. Yeah. Anyway, um... Uh, I figured basically when I when I discovered that the, that the casting that the professor doing the main stage Shakespeare production had brought me to final callbacks and didn't cast me so much as a walk on in the street and when I set a meeting with him I was so upset because I really loved Shakespeare I'd fallen in love with the Bard as you do in college yeah. and um, he said well well you're so striking. And you draw the eye, and if, you know a director must think of these things. And I'm like, isn't that what you want for your leading lady? And I realized what he was saying is, we're not putting a black person in a main stage production at UCLA. And I left. So um, six months later, I was cast in Flashdance, and that's how I got my SAG card. But wow. at the same time, I started working. St that's when I really started getting into music because my sister started to get more serious with it, and I started writing a little bit, and yeah. I was in a like one or two little tiny bands. And then my first touring experience ever uh, came about. I was in New York. Uh, my sister Lorelai was signed to Capitol Records and was recording an album produced by Nile Rodgers. And I was singing backing vocals with her. Right. And she got a call from a friend saying that Pink Floyd was looking for backing singers. So I literally, my first tour ever was Pink Floyd. Right. Wow. That is just amazing. <laughs> Yeah, so so you so you gravitated toward acting early on then. Yeah. So, um, did did, did Marsha encourage you to act? Um. Yeah, I 
mean, my Lorelai and I both really looked up to not only Marsha, you know, who was mm -hmm. uh, in um, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, the the cult classic Russ Myers film, right? Uh, as well as some really well known uh, like black exploitation films of the era, like Come Back Charleston Blue, and um, Jesus Christ Superstar. She was also in a single long. What? Sorry. Uh, Jesus Christ Superstar. Oh well, yeah, of course that that yeah. she was one of the lead dancers in that, and um, also uh, Bingo Long's traveling our star all stars in Motor Kings with yep. Billy D. Williams. She played his girlfriend, but our sister Dana also uh, acts and and is a choreographer and a professor of dance, and she was in Lead Belly and was the the choreographer for that. And also, as a songwriter, she co-wrote Pull Up to the Bumper for Grace Jones. So right. we wanted to emulate them a great deal. So, you know, I just carried on in their footsteps, basically. Yeah. Wow, that's that's so cool that you, uh, you're a tight-knit family like that. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I mean, I also danced a lot after being in Flashdance. I got booked to do these, like, trade shows in um uh where was it and the uh grand cayman uh and they wanted me to like dance because they they had it, it was a trade show for this sweatshirt and t-shirt company right. so of course they had all the ripped you know and sweatshirts like flash dance and i realized i was a really awful dancer <laughs> so i mean in terms of like jazz so i started studying quite intensely uh because of that and um i wound up doing a lot of uh videos i was an 80s video vixen like oh, yeah. you can see me you can see me featured quite prominently dancing in uh, criticize for alexander o'neill and uh ice cream castles for the time yeah. i'm in a janet jackson video when i think of you um david bowie day in day out oh yeah uh eurythmics i was featured dancer would i lie to you i'm dancing on a table you'll see me there in a minute yeah uh, for a minute so, um, yeah, I just, I wanted to be like my big sisters, and I, I was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you were at UCLA, did any of your classmates go on to become successful in the business? Oh, yeah. Um, well, Tim Robbins was at UCLA at the same time as right. I was. Uh, well, a guy that I actually went to high school with first, and then on to UCLA, is Lee Ehrenberg. Oh, yeah. And he, yeah, he's in uh, the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. He's the pirate that's at Ala Pope. That's, yeah. that's my old friend Lee, or Beef, as we called him at school. Um, <laughs> who else? Um, um, there, was, there was quite a few, uh, but I'm, I'm blanking, of course, right now on most of them. Um, anyway. Yeah, yeah I thought... <laughs> I've talked to a lot of people who were in the actors gang uh, with Tim Robbins, like Lance Guest yeah. and uh, Cameron Dye. Oh and yeah, Lance. Carrie Noonan. Yeah, and Cameron, and of course, yeah. Just a... Yeah, I've, I've, I've talked to a lot of those people. It's it's just amazing how you know there was so much camaraderie back then. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I actually one of the one of the productions that I was in that was a student directed production was directed by Tim. Mm -hmm. He did a production of, uh, of uh, oh God, Agamemnon, and I was in the chorus of that. That was fun. Um, Greek tragedy. So, yeah, Tim is such a wonderful, wonderful human being. I adore that man. And yeah. I knew back then that he was something special and was destined. And every time I see him now, I tell him that, you know, that I'm so proud of him. Yeah. He and he's just a good guy, you know. It sure shows in his work what a good guy he is, yeah. And, wow, you even knew it back then. I mean, even back then he was directing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's incredible. So so how did you get cast in Flashdance? Well, um, I first off, there was an open call for uh, the lead, actually you know, for Jennifer Beals' part. And it was a dance audition, and this is after I'd been studying. I was I was going to jazz classes like three or four times a week yeah. um, at that time. So I went, and I knew I wasn't going to get it, but it was an open call on the Paramount lot, and I figured, why not put my face in front of people? So I went. 
And then uh, a couple weeks later, or maybe a month later, uh, my boyfriend at the time, who was also an actor, got an audition on the Paramount lot, and I drove him to his audition. And this is back in the day where you could just drive somebody on the lot, and I was just sitting in my car waiting for him, and I looked over, and there was the Flashdance casting office. And I have no shame, so <laughs> I got up and walked into the office and said, hi. Yeah. <laughs> and um, the assistant casting director saw me and she said, I think I said to her something like, I should be in your movie. And she said, no, <laughs> there actually is a part that you could be good for. I'm going to have you read for it. And so I read for the part of Heels. And she said, you know, I want you to come back and read for the main casting director. Yeah. And when I came back, I was sitting on the desk. I was sitting on the on a bench, waiting. And this funny little Englishman walks over and sits down next to me. He goes, "Hello, who are you?" And I said, "I'm Durga, and I'm here to read for the part of Peel." So we had a nice little conversation. He was a really lovely man, and he got up and walked away. Right. And it turned out that was Adrian Lyne, the director. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I beat out like 250 girls for that part. Wow. How how was Adrian Lyne as a director? Oh, he's fantastic. He's absolutely fantastic. Although he would sometimes, he's very visual. Mm -hmm. So he would sometimes see something at lunch. Like he'd see a three-legged dog walking by a, by a chain link fence reflected in a puddle. And he'd go, quick, we've got to get this image. And like whatever was planned for that afternoon, would they'd stop and change the setup to capture this dog walking past the fence. And that's how he got some of his really iconic looks. I mean, you know, the scene where Jennifer's pulling the, the water onto herself in the chair. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the most iconic images in cinema. And that came out of his head. Um, and just a really, really sweet, humble, patient man. Wonderful director to work for. I would love to work with him again. It would be great. In fact, um, I'm still friends with a lot of the cast. And we've all talked about how much now we would love to do another project together. Yeah, I, I've talked to um, Malcolm Denaire. Um, I talked to Deborah Gordon. She was one of the repertory dancers, and she had been in um, a couple of Ro uh, George Romero zombie movies. You know, she was local casting. Um, yeah, I tried to I tried to get Liz Seagal at one point. Um, I ended up I I, I, interviewed, oh, wow. I interviewed her brother Joey though. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, uh, people you know people talk about just how great um, Jennifer Beals is in this movie, but I don't think they also realize how great Cynthia Rhodes was too. Oh, are you kidding? Well, first of all, Jennifer yeah. is an amazing actress and also a lovely lovely genuine down-to-earth person mm -hmm. she was a she was a fetus on that set she had her 18th birthday yeah. on set i remember because i'm a year old right but cynthia rhodes she she was not i mean she's a quadruple threat that woman i yeah. mean one of the most talented people i've ever worked with and also just so so down to earth, in fact, that she quit the business because she hated it. And yeah. all that talent, she just took it with her <laughs> and concentrated on being a wife and a mother, which I can't blame her for, but it breaks my heart because she's so stupid, stupefyingly talented. Yeah. Yeah, she did Staying Alive with John Travolta that year, and then she did that cheesy sci-fi movie yeah, with did. Tom Selleck, um, Runaway. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, with 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 Gene Sim Simmons. Ew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hated that movie. Those creepy spider things. Yeah, that was horrible. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the mechanical but, spiders. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dirty Dancing was great though. She was fabulous in that. Oh yeah, that's right. She was in that. Um, yeah. So was Jennifer Beals under a lot of pressure on set of this movie? Yeah. Yeah, everyone had, had high of hopes course. for her. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, although although I will say this. We had no idea what kind of hit this movie was going to be. 
I mean, everybody thought it was, I mean, we really enjoyed working together, which is why so many of the cast members are still friendly to this day. We had yeah. a real camaraderie. Um, we used to sit around and laugh at Michael Kaplan, the, the, um, the costume director. Yeah. We like, what in the hell is he doing with the ripping and the cutting of the t-shirts and the sweatshirts? And we thought it was ridiculous. And next thing you know, it's a, you know, it's a cultural phenomenon. Yeah, little girls running around with their leg warmers and their and their ripped, you know, shoulders, ripped T-shirts and sweatshirts. It, you know, crazy. One of the defining fashions of the '80s came out of that movie. Absolutely, and it became uh, one of the most parodied movies. Also, you know, with the um, what was it the the bucket of water that came down on her? Yeah. Yeah, it became like one of the most parodied movies of the yeah. '80s too. Yeah. Oh, it's true. In fact, there's commercials right now with Craig Anderson. Have you seen those? No. <laughs> with her game <laughs> detergent. She, I'm a gain, yeah, gain, yeah, gain. <laughs> you know, and he's like in the laundry room. Yeah. And then the guy comes in and he pulls a basket of laundry onto his head with his legs extended in the chair. It's hilarious. I laugh so hard I almost choke when I first saw it. You have to, <laughs> you have to go look it up. It's so funny. No. You know who Craig Anderson. Right? Oh, of course, of course. I'll I'll, yeah. I'll I'll pull it up on YouTube later. That sounds funny. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. It's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, you were in the Rosebud Beach Motel Hotel. Um, hotel. Oh yeah. Yeah. How was that experience? Yes, I was with the with the fantastic. Uh, well, two actors that are now gone. Um, they're Christopher Lee. Right. And. Um, Peter Scolari, who just died a couple of months ago. So, yeah. Such a nice... I've really been lucky to work with some incredibly nice people. Really, really nice people. I mean, Peter Scolari is just a sweetheart and yeah. so down to earth. And Christopher Lee, such a... Exactly what you would imagine him to be. A complete, consummate professional and a total gentleman... And I came up, I walked up to him. Uh, there's a scene, I think that's where I said it, uh, that we're, there's a concert being shot on the beach. Yeah. And um, uh, I walked up and introduced myself mm -hmm. and um, said to him that I was a huge Hammer Horror fan. Right. Uh, and he, you know, he's raised his eyebrows and he looked a little surprised that this that this wild looking black girl was a hammer horror fan. And, uh, cause I, I'm, I'm a real vampophile and I love vampire movies, but love he it. was very, very gracious and so nice to me. And I was really heartbroken when he died, but he was, he, he was just the coolest guy. And have you ever l looked up his life? Oh yeah. Dude, like literally like hunted Nazis and stuff. He was, a and you know, then was on a heavy metal album in his like, 70s or something he just was the coolest so and oh, one of the best Draculas on film far enough oh yeah I mean he really lived the life of uh, what created that darkness on screen you know and <laughs> um, I, there's a story that when he hosted Saturday Night Live in the late 70s he had one stipulation he did not want to do a Dracula parody because he was sick of being identified as Dracula <laughs> oh really I didn't know that oh yeah <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. Um, Hank Garrett was in the movie. Do you remember much about him? Um, wasn't he the the groundskeeper guy? Yeah. Yeah, he was really nice. Everybody again, the whole cast was really nice, and the the Curry sisters, oh, Marie yeah. and Sherry Curry. Oh yeah, were in it, and uh, oh god, uh, Colleen, a lot of people. Colleen, <laughs> Colleen. Oh, Fran Drescher. Right. Colleen uh, Camp. Colleen yeah. Camp, Eddie Deason, Jonathan Schmock, who was the, Eddie the, the snooty maitre d' in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, I know exactly who he was because he got to see me topless. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there was a stupid scene. You know, well, we were like hooker bellhops. Yeah. That's how we were like bringing the hotel back to life. And it was the one and only time you will see me topless in a film. But it's not like there was a whole lot to see because my, my, my titties were really tiny back then. So <laughs> they grew as I got older. <laughs> yeah. 
Were, were, were you in uh, Rebel Fighter? No, they did. <laughs> Rebel, Rebel Fighter? No. I'm, I'm sorry, Last Resort is what it's called. You played a Rebel Fighter, right? Yes. Yes, yeah. I did. That's correct. With the late, great, um, oh, God. Charles Groban. You know who I'm talking about. Who was the star of them? Charles Groban. That's right, Charles Groban. And he was another one who was really sweet, but just so I think he was really despondent that he was just in this stinker of a movie because it was so bad. Yeah. And it was obviously just going to suck. And it wasn't even like a B movie. It was more like an R or Q movie. Yeah. <laughs> like straight to video. <laughs> it was really horrible. But he was really, I'm, I'm very pleased that I got to spend an afternoon working with him and kind of laughing around between takes and stuff. He was very gracious. Yeah, I, just, I don't know if I've ever done a film with anyone that was, like, not kind. I mean, with, uh, like, I don't think I've worked with any real prima donnas or anyone that was just a jerk. Oh, that's good. Some, a lot of people can't say that, but that's so good. <laughs> that you got to uh, work with a lot of nice people. Yeah, I, ju I just talked to Zane Busby, who directed the movie. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Well, what's he up to? She, she's um, uh, it, she's uh, devoted her time to helping ho Holocaust survivors. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Sorry, I didn't... I didn't remember who directed it I, I one afternoon on the film yeah <laughs> how does um, <laughs> Vendetta come to you oh my god <laughs> you've just been digging up my resume haven't you oh yeah I go um, deep <laughs> well <laughs> Vendetta was yet again another like not even B movie yeah. it was like an uh, cute movie yeah it was so bad um but we had a ball um sandy um uh, blanking on her last name who was like the the head bad guy the you know the the mean woman in the prison she was a sweetheart and i i actually almost did um a play with her of uh, original one act, uh, mm -hmm. one of which was going to be mine, but we never got it off the ground. Um, and Ken Schreiner from General Hospital was in right. it. He's really good friends. He's, Malcolm is one of his best friends, oh. Malcolm Danar. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, oh, Marta. Marta Cobra was in that. Oh, yeah. Really talented girl who. <laughs> went astray a few years ago, well, quite a few years ago, and that's unfortunate because she was very talented and was really online to, to have a career that took off, but yeah. some people just can't quite get there. Um, but I loved her. And, uh... Yeah, she was in Friday... Yeah, she, I mean... She was in Friday the 13th Part 2 when she was, like, underage getting naked in that movie. Yeah. 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 Uh, but yeah, there was a lot of we had a we had a ball shooting that movie, even that was horrible. We had so much fun; it was ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, I, I enjoyed that shooting that. It was fun. It was really fun. Even I mean, because we again, this is another film where actually we were right this time. We were laughing that it was such a dog that it was like never going to do anything, and we were right. <laughs> I mean, the premise is ridiculous. Seriously, so the young girl who's the young, little sister of the stunt woman. Mm -hmm. Gets raped, kills her attacker, gets thrown in prison for murder, gets murdered because she won't put out for the the head baddie in the prison. Yeah. The the yeah. So the sister goes on a crime spree <laughs> to get thrown into the same prison so she can investigate her little sister's death. Seriously, really? Somebody put money up behind this movie. <laughs> That's the funny part about it. It's just all the bad '80s cliches and and like chicks behind bars movies all rolled into one delightfully just tacky package. <laughs> <laughs> Sandy Martin was the lead or the villain. Sandy Martin, I should say. yeah, that's right. And she's she's a fantastic character actress. She's been in everything. Every everybody's yeah. seen her in. She's a wonderful wonderful person too. I love Sandy. I'd love to see her. Yeah. 
And then you were in um, Earth Girls Are Easy. Oh, yeah. That was another one. That was fun. Um, Jeff Goldblum, amazing, yeah. amazingly eccentric character, as you imagine him to be, yeah. was reading. He got me into P.G. Woodhouse because he would read uh, the all the characters aloud in between takes, doing all the voices right. from the book he was reading. Um, and um, poor Gina Davis. I felt really sorry for her uh, shooting that film because that was near the end of their marriage. Yeah. And um, he was just a dog. <laughs> he was such a dog. His flirt. It, well, I mean, for one thing, women were just like throwing themselves at him right in front of her, which I thought was just horrible. I believe it. <laughs> and oh yeah, and, but the the bad part was he wasn't really pushing him aside. And uh, and uh, Charles Rocket, God bless him. Yeah. What was yeah. Julian? What was Julian Temple like as a director? I think he's a very visionary guy. Once again, another amazing director. Um, and I'm trying to think of what else I did with. I did Earth Girls Are Easy, and then I think I did a video with him, and I, I can't remember which one it was. But um, Julian's a lovely guy. Really, really nice. I, I, I love him. As, I mean, Absolute Beginners is one of my favorite films. Oh, yeah. And very underrated director, in my opinion. Um, once again, someone I'd love to work with again. Yeah, I, I love Absolute Beginners, too. That's a, that's a very underrated movie. I talked to an actress from it a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we... Uh, oh, that was another one we had a blast on, because the scene uh, where they're in the club... That was a three day, three or four day shoot. Yeah. And uh, in fact, some friends of mine and I, we all talked about, we, we had the bare bones of it, a script. Um, and then somebody went on to do it, of course, but about what life is like for background performers. Yeah. Uh, because there were like all these, especially when you've got like a scene that, that that's that big, mm -hmm. there were so many little dramas going on um, behind the scenes that nobody knew about. And like this one girl was trying to get everyone's attention, which is being really obnoxious and, you know, just kind of being extra loud and then getting up on the stage area and like doing these really obvious stretches like, Oh, I'm so tight in my legs and just like spreading her legs. And I was like, bitch, really? Are you serious? Yeah. And she actually took her pants off, that's right, to do these stretches. So she's, like, going into the splits and all this stuff, trying to get, you know, Julian's attention and, yeah. you know, and Jeff's attention and all that kind of stuff. So we stole her pants. <laughs> <laughs> she must we have stole been... her pants. She no, must... just wait, wait. Uh -huh. So, it, you know, it was a real nightclub that we were shooting in. So there was a, one of those basketball uh, games, you yeah. know that you have to make baskets. So I'm really tall. So I, I took her pants and threw it over the basket in the game. Yeah. <laughs> so she had to like climb in there to get them. When, when she realized her pants were missing, she was like, it's not my pants. Not my, pants. <laughs> my friends and I almost threw up. We were laughing so hard. It was hilarious. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> ah, those are the games. And in that, in that film mm -hmm. and in that scene, of course, but I met Jeff for the first time. Right. But I also met Damon Wayans. And Jim Carrey. And, um, and Jim Carrey. And Damon and Jim were just, once again, just nice. So nice and polite mm -hmm. and really sweet. They were, um, they were just really, really lovely. I mean, they were brand new, wet behind the ears actors. I think that was Jim's first film come to think of it um actually he had done but a few they, before that um he did once bitten um the deadpool which was a dirty hairy movie uh but peggy sue got married wait a minute wait 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 once bitten was before earth girls i don't think so it, are you sure i swear to god it was 1985 that one came out okay all yeah. right okay i thought earth girls was before that well anyway he was he was still very very new Right, and so was um, and then Jeff. Uh, I went on to run into him a few times later uh, throughout the years, 
uh, and I've sat in with his jazz uh, his quartet ja- his or quintet band. a yeah. couple of times. Yeah, and I'm trying to put out a jazz album myself, and I'm trying to get a hold of him to play on a song that we performed live together on, and I will. Nice. I always get my man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's a lovely, he's a lovely, eccentric, quirky character. Oh, yeah. He's exactly as you imagine him to be. He really is. Oh, yeah, I've never heard anything bad about him, but I have heard that he is a flirt, though. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that he is. That he is. So, how was guest starring on Hunter? Well, <laughs> it's very funny because I did that, and um, when we were on set, the the story was called Lullaby, and uh, it was about this weird serial killer who was an English lord who'd come over to Los Angeles, and he, you know, tended to go for the English hookers and killed him uh after uh playing this music box that he brought with him and so the scene is you know i of course was playing uh your typical hooker on the host role in hollywood and this other girl and so we were uh fighting over him in the scene but he goes for um the english hooker who was played by um perry lister um, you must have Harry Lister, that's right, who is the mother of Billy Idol's child. Right. Uh, and is also the one that was on the crucifix in the Hot in the City video, which, oddly enough, I'm also in. So yeah. talk about going full circle. So um, when we were on set, we didn't talk to the actor who played the murderer because he was so creepy and stayed in character like the whole time that we just gave him a wide berth and years later i realized i'd been acting opposite gary sinise wow (laughs) i had no idea that it was because it was very early in his career as well yeah and he was just so intense and awful and like okay i'm gonna go to my car when we finish shooting and he's gonna be there and he's gonna kill me (laughs) (laughs) he was that good we were just like, oh, hell no, we need to stay the fuck away from this guy. So, anyway, so that's what shooting that was like. That was fun. And the legendary Corey Allen directed. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> if you say so, <laughs> I don't remember. Who's, why is he legendary? Who's Corey Allen? Oh, he was an actor. I, I, you know, he, this was, he was an actor, like, back in the 60s and stuff. I'm trying. I'm, oh, try, I'm, okay. try, I'm trying. To think I didn't off- know who he was. Yeah, I'm trying to think offhand what he did and stuff, but he did a lot of work. Um, how about in the Eye of the Snake? Okay, now that was quite an experience because I had cast double cast. Actually, I was double booked uh, in that and uh, Predator Two. But again, in Predator 2, I had been cast as your typical black hooker. That's in the 80s. Black women were cast mostly as hookers or prison inmates or sometimes domestics or, you know, the sassy black friend. There was like a very limited range of roles we could get. So when I was offered the film in Africa... uh, because In the Eye of the Serpent was shot in Burundi, and it was the first film ever shot there, mm-hmm. uh, where I got to play the mistress of a man who was being played by what was described to me as the Jack Nicholson of France, Philippe Leotard. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, and I got to, I had maybe three shooting days in six weeks, and I got to be in Africa for six weeks. I was like, um, yeah. I take that one. So, I mean, I might have been seen by more people had I taken Predator 2, but I'm I'm so thankful and grateful that I did the film in Africa because also um, mm-hmm. another person in that film was the magnificent Malcolm McDowell. Right. Who was a fabulous, fascinating individual. I love him to death. He's amazing. 
and uh, also um, Lois Childs, who uh, was Dr. Holly Goodhead in Moonraker. She was a Bond girl. Right. And also played the horrible, horrible bitch that got murdered in Death on the Nile. Yeah. Um, once again, a cast with an amazing uh, camaraderie. Um, everybody but the director. <laughs> we didn't quite gel with him very well, unfortunately. So, uh, but I got to be in Africa for six weeks. It wow. was amazing. I mean, I, I'm actually writing my autobiography. Nice. And uh, one of the chapters is about my time in Africa and the experience of breaking the cloud cover as the plane was descending. And you hear about Africa being the cradle of life. And, you know, I've been to Hawaii and Jamaica and other places, but there just seemed to be shades of green that I had never seen in my life. I mean, just this vibrant, vivid emerald and chartreuse and just the, I, the whole place just appeared like it was breathing to me. It was amazing. And when the air yeah. hit my skin, when the door of the plane was open, it, I had a deep profound experience my it's it like sunk into my dna that i was built for this place it was amazing it was amazing and i really would love to go back and do something there again sometime yeah that's so cool so uh cory allen played james dean's rival in rebel without a cause that's oh the, that's okay his, yeah that's his most famous role and he did like I had not yeah, he did like 60 film and television roles before he turned to directing. Wow, I didn't know. Nobody told me. <laughs> yeah, I guess he didn't want people to, I guess. So, with Pink Floyd, I mean, you, you were on tour with them for a long time, weren't you? I sure was. From November of 1987 to the last show in, I think it was 1995. And I'm on the last four albums, so yeah. that, the last one came... 2018. Yeah. That just, no, not 2018. What I'm talking about it came out in 2014. Sorry. Yeah, that just that just must have been amazing. I mean, did you were you pitching yourself every day when you were with those guys? Um, you know, it's weird. I I first, you know, as I mentioned, I got asked to go down uh, when I was working with my sister. Mm -hmm. They started the Momentary Lapse of Reason tour. And they only had two singers, which were um, Machan Taylor and Rachel Fuhrer. Right. And uh, for they wanted to do a concert film. Uh, and what happened was the head of the production company, um, David, asked him if he knew any singers, and he recommended Lorelai. And uh, because I happened to be in New York working with her, she recommended me. And um, then another friend, Roberta Freeman, and so we sent some photos and some tapes, and they said, okay, they sound good. And they flew us down. And uh, we had rehearsed some of the songs, and uh, we're sitting backstage, and this man walks over with the guitar and says, uh, right, hello, uh, would you like to go over some of the parts? And we, we were like, oh, I, I was like, yeah. who's that? I didn't know what David Gilmore looked like, because that was one of the things about Pink Floyd, is they really made a point of not thrusting their faces in front of the camera, like the antithesis of the Rolling Stones in Mick Jagger. So I didn't know who he was right. until he opened his mouth and started singing, and then I was like, oh. <laughs> and I was a Pink Floyd fan, but I just didn't know, you know who any of them were. So we went over some of the more difficult parts, and uh, he said, right, you sound good. Would you like to have a go tonight? You know, because we were meant to sit and watch the show, and then film the next couple of nights and so when he said would you like to have a go tonight we said okay not i mean what are we gonna do <laughs> i'm not ready <laughs> no so we you know when opportunity knocks you better open that door so um we got ready and i went from my biggest show before that being in front of maybe three or four hundred people maybe to fifteen thousand people and I walked out on the stage, and I looked up and looked around the arena, and I thought to myself, this is where I belong. Yeah. And uh, 
subsequently I was asked to join the tour and I'm the one they kept all the way to the end. So it was pretty meant to be. Yeah, wow. Yeah, Learning the Fly was my introduction to Pink Floyd. I was I was only four when that came out, and I remember seeing that video on MTV <laughs> constantly back in those days. It even made, like, one of their, like, top ten countdown, like, number one videos or something that year, because it was, it was played so much and, and it was requested so much. Yeah, I'm a huge Pink Floyd guy. I actually went to go see Roger Waters do The Wall in its entirety in 2012, and... A lot of it sounded pre-recorded, but it was just amazing, the visuals of what was going on, you know, on screen. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's an amazing show. I saw that show. Yeah. That that album that they did in 2014, The Endless River, what, what happened with that album? It, it seems like that it didn't get the attention that it deserved. I agree. Well, I, I can speak from my perspective. Mm -hmm. Um... I have a band called Blue Pearl, also, right. that's with um, Youth, who is a founding member of Killing Joke, uh, and he co-produced The Endless River, and he's the other half of Blue Pearl, basically. Yeah. Um, so uh, I went over to his house, we hadn't seen each other for years, and we had a long talk, and talked about doing some more Blue Pearl stuff. And he said to me, uh, can you keep a secret? And I said, sure. And he said, well, the label have pointed out that per the contract with Pink Floyd, um, they owed them another few albums. And he, David said, well, how about we give you one? And uh, they said, okay. So they started putting together The Endless River. And they'd started several years before and had different people producing. And then they just kind of drift away from it and then youth came and kind of pulled it back together and breathed new life into it and he mentioned to David that I was coming over and asked him if he wanted me to sing on some stuff and David was somewhat non-committal because it was meant to be instrumental right. completely and uh, so, but youth said look you're here so why don't you just listen to the whole thing and uh, if something jumps out at you that you want to sing on We'll record it, and I'll send it over to him. And, you know, no harm, no foul. If he doesn't like it, he won't use it. And if he does, then cool. So I picked three songs, and uh, they turned out to be Talking Hawk and Surfacing and Louder Than Words. And so I recorded all my parts. This is before there were any vocals on the album whatsoever. Right. right. And you sent them over to David, and a couple of weeks went by, and you thought, oh, God, did I make a mistake? And he finally said, well, what did you think about what Durga did? And David said, oh, I loved it. So he kept everything I did and, in fact, went back. And I went back in when he had come up with the, or Polly actually wrote the lyrics to Louder Than Words, and uh, they turned that into a single. Um, and uh, I sang more back and vocal parts with some other singers under the choruses. Uh, but all the, the other, you know, the, uh, uh, at the end and all that, yeah. I, I made all that up. That was all me. And I sang it before he did. So uh, that's how that came about. And uh, it, of course, it, it all started from some things um, that were recorded years earlier with Richard Wright. And so it was meant to be a loving tribute to him. Yeah. I heard you tell a story in a previous interview that uh, you, you, the girls, singers, and the band members all used to pull pranks on each other, and sometimes those pranks would involve nudity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, near the end of the tour, we would start pulling pranks. And, uh, well, yeah, um, there was one show in particular where uh, it was Lorelai, Rachel, and I, mm -hmm. And uh, we were about to do the Great Gig in the Sky, which, of course, is very somber, very serious. Yeah. And we, you have to, no, you really do have to, like, kind of psych yourself up to sing that piece because it's incredibly difficult to sing. Mm -hmm. And so um, we're right at the front edge of the stage, and the music is swelling and all of that, and the slide guitar is going mm, like that, and Rachel opens her mouth. And in the meantime, in the dark, at below the level of the stage, you know, there's a little pit sort of between the stage and the audience. Mm 
mm-hmm. for security purposes. Yeah. And into this area strolls Eddie Perez, who was the head of security, and Gary Wallace, the percussionist, because he didn't play on that song. And they're wearing these long coats. And right when Rachel takes a deep breath to sing her first note, they throw the coats open. And they were naked underneath. Yeah. Now, they had their backs to the audience, so the audience couldn't see. But we could see, and they were just shaking their junk at us yeah. through the whole song. <laughs> and... Um, so we had to get through the song while they were doing that, and we did because we're professionals. But then we thought, right, well, now we got to do something. <clears throat> so during another brick in the wall, uh, we would kind of do this marching step facing the front, and then David, w- who was to our left, would do a solo. So we'd turn left to face him, and then Tim Rennick on a riser behind us would do a second solo. So then we'd turn our backs to the audience to face him while he was doing a solo. And when he did, mm-hmm. we pulled our tops down because they were those stretchy kind of um, spandex dresses. Yeah. And we pulled our tops down so our tits were all out. But the audience, again, could not see because we had our backs to them. But he could see it. He had to play his whole solo with our tits out. So, yeah, we got up to some pretty funny pranks. But that was pretty funny. But my favorite one, I yeah. think, was uh, I think we were in Modena, mm-hmm. and I was out walking in the town, in the city during the day, and I walked past this little music shop, and there was a box of kazoos in the window, and I had a brilliant idea, so I bought the whole box, and then the show came on, and this was when we did uh, Money, and there was the arrangement where there was a whole breakdown section in the middle, and, you know, Guy did his solo, and you know, all that kind of stuff. And the girls, we had our little solo. And then to come back into the main part of the song, David would do the full on, you know, guitar rock god thing. He played this line, and the band would respond, so anyway. Um, it gets to that part in the song, and secretly, unbeknownst to David, I passed out the kazoos to the whole band. Mm-hmm. So he's facing the the audience, and he breaks into the da 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 and we all with our kazoos respond, me, 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 and he turned around and laughed so hard, he almost didn't finish playing the song. But we, we managed to get through it. <laughs> that was a good one. Yeah, and what's the audience reaction to these pranks? Of course they laugh, although the oh, yeah. ones where they couldn't see, yeah. they didn't know. Yeah. They, that was just for the band. Yeah. <laughs> but that one, the audience loved it. They, they thought it was hilarious. It is hilarious. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> I'm a fun person to tour with, let's put it that way. Yeah, you sure sound like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were at Blue Pearl, did you go on tour? Yes, quite a bit. Yeah, who who'd you uh, tour with? Uh, it was me and um, my two dancers, usually. Right, but but did you open for anybody big? No, I was the headliner. What are you talking about? Oh. <laughs> I, I mean, okay, I, I'm trying to think. Co-headline is what I should say, not open for. No. No, it was just it was just. Blue Pearl, and that was it. Well, I did. I did. I'm trying to think. I mean, I did some shows like for like uh, radio stations would have mm-hmm. these things. Oh, I did. I did some shows with uh, the band James because we were on the same circuit at the time. Okay. Uh, and I'm trying to think of who else. Um, what other dance acts were big at the time? Uh, uh, yeah, James was an odd. We did. What? Yeah. Was Technotron there? Who? Technotron. Uh, did they do Pump Up the Jam? Is that the name oh, of them? Um, no. I yeah. don't think I did a show with them. Okay. Yeah, you mentioned before. Why? Does it say I did? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I'm just pulling a random name out of my ass. <laughs> Technotronic, you mean? Technotronic, yes. Yeah. Um, no, I, I never ran across them. I did... Uh, this one, uh, oh God, what's it called? Uh, I think it was called It's a Knockout, which was like one of those shows where you had teams and all these events uh, 
these physical events and this one was on water and we had to like do like jet ski races and some other crazy stuff and uh mm-hmm. betty boo was on my team she was big in the uk at that time and uh i also did racy ladies day at silverstone racetrack that was a lot of fun which was for great ormond street children's uh hospital right. and um it was basically groups of women from all different walks of life, and I was on the entertainment uh, business um, team. And Sherry Lungi, who played Guinevere in, uh, um, oh God, uh, what's the sword? Um, Excalibur. Excalibur, uh, yeah. Yeah, she was on my team. Uh, that was fun. And we had to basically do a bunch of events or, uh, at Silverstone Racetrack. Uh, we we got to drive the track in a pace car. We did uh, an obstacle course with quad bikes. Uh, oh no no, we did a race with quad bikes. We did an obstacle course with an eighteen wheeler. Mm. That was fun. Uh, and we also got to do like a pit crew change, like a tire change on a Formula One car. Right. And I was the only one strong enough with uh, had enough upper body strength to handle the pneumatic jack. But we actually had a competition uh, time. We we changed our tire in like eight seconds, uh, eight yeah eight one six seconds, something like that, something crazy. So um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I re- I remember when you were in the uh, David Lee Roth video specifically. Yeah. Yeah. That was fun. It was a sweetheart. Yeah, California Girls, Yankee Rose, that one cracks me up. Yeah, you know what, uh, what you say to that uh, to that convenience store clerk. Yeah, not if you yeah. Was, not if you was the last immigrant grocer on earth. <laughs> yeah, it's not particularly politically correct now. But yeah. it was fun back then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Those were fun to make with him. I dated him for a second. Oh, you did. <laughs> mm-hmm. David is incredibly intelligent. Yeah. And really sweet. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people, you know, they, they, they talk about how eccentric he is, right? And you, and it's it's valid, but he, yeah, he you can tell he's very smart, that guy. Very, very smart. Yeah, I, I wish we'd have gone out more. I don't know, he ran away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's funny because I, I read an interview later with him uh, mm-hmm. once where he was saying, someone asked him what kind of woman he liked. Yeah. And they, he said, I like, I like a woman that one day we could go to an art museum and discuss, you know, all of the, the, the fine art there. And the next day we could go to magic mountain. And I'm like, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> he probably carried a torch for you. <laughs> well, he told me, um, that he called me up out of the blue one day and said that I was one of the few true women of spirit that he'd ever met. And, uh, he wanted to take me to dinner and then it turned out, to be like this huge, uh, just the, the, this, the logistical coordination with his office and all of that, and getting, you know, finding out where I lived and all that. And he came and he picked me up and he asked me what I wanted to eat. And, you know, we went and we had a lovely conversation. And said, well, what would you like to do after this? And I said, I want to go out dancing. So we went out dancing and then he took me home. Mm-hmm. And that was that. Wow. I'm not going to say that that was the only thing that happened because something happened before the night that he took me out to dinner. I'm not yeah. going to talk about, but um, yeah, I always wondered why why we never went out more. We should have. He was silly. I think I was too much for him. <laughs> but that's awesome. You got to do that. I saw Van Halen uh, with David in 2012, and you'll never believe who opened uh, for them. Cool in the gang. Wow. That's kind of wild. It was, because you, you would never think of Cool and the Gang opening for Van Halen. <laughs> but That's true. It, it, was a, it was a great show. I enjoyed it. So Great. Tell me about David, uh, David Bowie, though. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> One of the hands-down nicest human beings I have ever met in my life. Seriously. Yeah. So sweet. So, so just personable. So humble. Um, well, I did the video for Day In, Day Out. I think I did that first. I can't remember. Um, and 
I was talking to the choreographer because you know he shot the whole thing on roller skate. Yeah. And uh, do you do you have in front of you what year that was? Day in day out when that came out. Eighty seven. Eighty seven. Yeah. Okay. So I did that first. Uh, uh, and um, we were shooting on Hollywood Boulevard, and once again playing your quintessential black hooker. <laughs> and uh, so I'm talking to the choreographer, and uh, he walks up and he goes, "Hello." I'm David. And I was like, uh, duh. <laughs> oh, I didn't say that, but I'm thinking, <laughs> this is your video, and you're one of the most famous people in the world. I know who you are. And he was just really nice and just humble and just chatting and laughing with us. Mm -hmm. And then later, um, when we were in Lausanne, Switzerland, with when I started, I started touring with Pink Floyd, this was probably later in either 88... Or 89. I think it was probably 1988. Yeah. Uh, he came to the show because he had a house in, in Lausanne. And uh, normally a VIP guest would sit out in the, by the middle of the house mis mixing desk. But because it was festival seating and there was no way to get to that desk through the crowd, uh, he had to sit at the monitor mix desk next to the stage, which was actually below the level of the stage. And um, it was on the side where us girls were singing. And so we come out and, you know, we're wearing our typical short spandex dresses. And we all realized at the same time, we looked down and he's sitting there and we thought, oh, my God, I'm doing this entire show and David Bowie can see up my dress. <laughs> so we were incredibly nervous and we were terrible that night. <laughs> <laughs> but he was really sweet. He was really, really lovely, and I'm, I'm so, so glad I got to meet him before he passed away. I was yeah. devastated. Yeah, Hunky Dory just turned fifty this week. That's a great album. That's crazy. That's crazy. That's just crazy. Don't tell me things like that. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. When I talked uh, with Lorelai, uh, we talked about the Hot in the City <laughs> video. Uh, that video was banned from MTV, from what I, from what I heard. Yeah. Because of Perry strapped to the cross. Yeah. That's why. It wasn't anything else. That's the reason it was banned. Yeah. I'm surprised his shock to the system video didn't get banned. That was just crazy with all those wires coming out of him. You know, the robot. Uh, but no, gears. but there was nothing offensive about that. No, no, but it was just, it was crazy. <laughs> oh, it's a great video. But here's the thing. I did, I did yeah. the Hot in the City video first. Mm -hmm. And then later, you know, he decided he wanted to do this techno album. Yeah. And the producer, um, Robin, you know, well, I guess both of them liked Blue Pearl. And he blew me over to L.A. because I was living in London then. Mm -hmm. And I'm all over uh, cyberpunk. Right. And it really bumped me out. That album was way before its time. Uh and especially in terms of the way he marketed it, because it was in the fledgling days of the internet. And um, nobody was ready to hear him change his sound. You know, they all wanted the, you know, rebel yell sound. And this was techno. Right. Uh, I'm really proud of that album. And we, in fact, uh, recorded a duet of a song that I wrote called Mother Dawn. And that was pretty cool in the studio because we were trying to figure out what song to do a duet on. And uh, he was like, we were saying, what about this? No, what about this? And he's like, well, I really want to do you know, something that sounds like this. And then he's like, why don't we do that one? And so we start singing my song. Dancing around the fire, circling. And I'm like, that's Billy Idol singing my song. <laughs> That's a good impression of him, by the way. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I heard his newest single. It was pretty good. It had a Bruce Springsteen vibe to it. Oh, I haven't heard it. I'll have to give it a listen. Yeah, it came out this past summer. So how far yeah. along are you in your memoir? Not far enough. <laughs> <laughs> I really need to like buckle down, and I should be working on it every day, and I'm horribly undisciplined when it comes to my writing and I need to buckle down. I could knock it out in two weeks if I just sat down and just did it. Yeah. I haven't. 
yeah, I, I wrote my memoir like like every week for like four or five months, and then I just stopped after a while because I just got tired of crying. But I plan on going back to huh. it. I plan on going back to it uh, as soon as I get a minute because um, um, I've written some pretty good stuff in it. But yeah, I know how it is writing a memoir. <laughs> Oh, cool. You'll have to give me some tips on how to organize it. Because I started it as a, uh, I was in a group that had a writing exercise that you had to write three pages a day, every day for 30 days. And that's how I started it. So I've got, I've got maybe three or four chapters, um, but I need to write a lot more. Yeah, mine, because I, you know, I'm talking about my love of cult movies in in the book and um i'm talking about you know where i was when i saw it how old i was how it affected me i'm writing a memoir and that kind of thing it's like part movie guide and part memoir you know <clears throat> but yeah i mean as, as long as you you know you're being real and you're talking about real stuff you know you got uh, a, a good book there you know i mean th- i mean talking to you i mean you've got great stories so I, I, you, I don't think you have anything to worry about Thank you. I, I I know it's going to be a great book. I just got to get it out of me. That's all. Yeah. How's the uh, COVID situation been over there in Italy? Well, they're cracking down a lot more now. Yeah. So um, they they're not, they're taking it very seriously. So I don't you know I I they, but because they have been you know Italy has some of the lowest rates in the EU. So that's good. That's good. Yeah, we have a low death rate over here too. Uh, last year it was like seventy, which is you know which is good but bad for the families. I forgot. Where are you? Redding, California. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow, that is low. Yeah, <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's been pretty crazy over here. We see a lot of protesters on the street, which is just insane, you know. But that's everywhere. Everyone's yeah. protesting about something. It's, you know, I was, I was, for most of the pandemic, I was in Los Angeles, so. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you just, so you were in Los Angeles and then you went uh, back to Italy or you, you moved In there? August. Mm-hmm. I came back to Italy in August. Yeah. Cause I moved here first in 2017 mm-hmm. and then I went, I would go back for like a month, uh, and then, uh, back to my place in California. And then when I went back in, uh, January of 2020, uh, I meant to come back here, and then all hell broke loose. Uh, do you have any upcoming projects? As a matter of fact, I do. Um, well, I actually just... I i have to leave the EU every 90 days, so I went to London um, at the beginning, you know, at the end of November, mm-hmm. and uh, I recorded some stuff with a guy named Rich Matthews, which... Uh, he's doing an album um, based on all the the um, zodiac signs, uh, the 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 gemstones that correspond to the zodiac signs. So right. every song is the name of the gemstone. Um, and then I went and saw my old partner Youth, and I worked on um, Lee Scratch Perry died this year. Uh, Youth was in the middle of producing an album with him, and he has all of his vocal tracks. So I did a co-write and uh, a vocal on one of those songs that that album should be coming out next spring, as well as a band called Fluke. Um, We co-wrote and recorded what I think sounds like a big single. So keep your eyes, keep your ears and eyes peeled for that. Um, I also, God, what else is going on? I mean, Blue Pearl has recorded a new album over the last several years, and we're just looking for a place to release it. Nice. Uh, We're about 90% finished. And um, once uh, that happens, it'll come out. Um, What else have I got going on? Uh, I have my own Pink Floyd tribute band, (coughs) excuse me, called Pink Floyd Legacy. And we're slated to go on tour in Russia in May, but I don't know if it's going to happen or not, just because, you know, everything with touring is so up in the air with COVID. Right. Uh, as well as um, my sister, Lorelai, and I, uh, we released an album under the name The McBroom Sisters last summer. Oh. 
and we were meant to have our debut live on Cruise to the Edge in 2020, but that got pushed back to uh, May of 2022. So I'll be going to Florida um, to do the cruise. Cruise to the Edge is a big prog rock cruise. Um, and I think this year Marillion is headlining. I'm not sure. Um, but then we'll do that. And then I'm supposed to go straight from there to Russia. And there's some other stuff that's going on that I can't talk about yet. Right. But it's pretty exciting. Oh, that's awesome. I'm glad you got all this going on. You know, I mean, it, it, it at least gives you hope, you know, that um, that this whole, um, this whole clusterfuck that we've been in is going to be under control. I sure hope so. Yeah, that's so awesome. So really quickly, um, we got to play my secret silly game. I played this with Marsha and Lorelai. This is a, a series of silly slumber party questions. No win or lose, just pure fun. And how, okay. the, how the game works is I ask you the question, you answer it, and then you ask me the exact same question, I answer it. And feel free to comment on answers. Okay. Okay. Durga, are you ticklish? Yes. Are you ticklish? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, I've been known to hit people in the groin without warning. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, you gotta, okay. you got to warn me first. <laughs> okay. Good to know. Uh, what's your favorite part of the body? It could be anything. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an interesting question because it depends on whose body you're talking about. Um uh, hmm. I love, on a man, mm -hmm. the curve of the neck into the shoulder and, oh, yeah. and the like, trapezius area. I love that on a man. On a woman, I love the back, the curve and the, you know, I, I, I don't know. It depends. It depends. But then there's a real obvious answer, that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> if it's <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I love and on me I love my lips. Mm -hmm. You do have nice lips, I have to say. Thank you. Of and I got pretty rocking legs too, I must say, for an old broad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so what's your favorite part of the body, Tommy? Uh the belly button. Huh. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Are are you an in or an Audi? Well, it's funny. When I was little and when I was younger, I was an Audi, but then I got rounder and bigger and became an innie. Nice. Yeah, I'm an Audi. Yeah? Okay. Um, what color are your toenails painted? Right now, mm -hmm. they're not. Okay. But my fingernails are a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mine are not painted... <laughs> Mine are not painted right now. Last time they were, they were lavender purple. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like to go bright colors. What would you, there you go. What would you say is your best personality trait? Um, it'd be one of two. Okay. Uh, I, I would say either my sense of humor yes. or my tenacity. I agree. <laughs> and what about you, Tom? Um, I have empathy, and I also have no filter. Ah, there you go. Okay. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then my favorite question, is there a stinky smell that just makes you gag? <laughs> vomit. <laughs> that's a popular one. <laughs> yeah, vomit. Absolutely. What about you? Um, it's either farts or feet. Really? Yeah. Huh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I got a, a couple Christmas jokes here. Um, why did Frosty the Snowman have a smile on his face? I don't know. He saw the snowblower. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's bad. <laughs> 
Why, why did why did the elf uh, get upset at having a sweater for Christmas? Why? He wanted either a moaner or a screamer. <laughs> <laughs> These are terrible dad jokes. Yeah. <laughs> I know so many uh, public domain jokes. It's insane. It's like I have a Rolodex in my brain. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite joke is... Too filthy to tell on your interview. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just, just really just bad. No, you would be like, ah, no. <laughs> oh, it, 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 it takes a lot to offend me. <laughs> it's pretty offensive, so never mind. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, Durga, I want to thank you so much for coming on today. And I'd love to have you back sometime to talk about uh, vampire movies because I'm a vampire movie aficionado. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah oh absolutely I'll, I'll talk all day long about that awesome well you have yourself a happy holiday season and please stay safe are you going to uh, go back to LA for the holidays no but I was actually looking at booking a flight to um, Holland to visit some friends right when you called <laughs> nice nice well I'll let you get back to that and you have yourself a great day and you too thank you so much thank you bye bye Bye. Well, there you have it. Durga McBroom. Ain't she a sweetheart? Oh, my God. What a awesome, awesome lady. Just like her sisters. She, she's, got great, she's got great genes, that woman. <laughs> so glad we got to talk today. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, There's no shame in living in the past. Because the present sucks. Later, dudes. <laughs>